Good morning, everyone. For, just first an announcement, we know there's a number of things happening over in the Capitol building and on the floor. We will move as quickly and readily as possible, so I appreciate members' patience and trying to get through into the witnesses. Thank you. If someone could get the door in the back of the room, I'd appreciate that. So this is a hearing of the Energy and Commerce Committee on the ACA's cost sharing reduction program ramifications of the administration's decision on the source of funding for the CSR program. We say the Constitution is clear, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. This means that the executive branch cannot spend money unless Congress says it can. Uh, Yet just yesterday, the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the Department of Treasury testified before the Ways and Means Committee, quote, if Congress doesn't want the monies appropriated, it could pass a law saying do not appropriate the monies from that account, unquote. That's a direct quote. It's in direct contradiction to the principles of appropriations law. It's an affront to the powers granted to Congress and the Constitution. And I don't agree with the concept of that which is not forbidden is permitted. We're here today to examine the ramifications of the administration's legal decision to fund the Affordable Care Act's cost-sharing reduction program through a permanent appropriation. We aren't here to discuss whether or not the decision is illegal. A federal district court has already decided that it is. We're here today to talk about the consequences of the administration's brazen attempt to grab the power of the purse from Congress. The ACA established the CSR program, but did not fund it. The administration knew this and requested an annual appropriation for the CSR program in the President's fiscal year 2014 budget request. Congress, however, denied that request. But just a few months later, the administration began making CSR payments anyway. How? Well, the administration decided to raid the permanent appropriations for tax refunds and credits, an action which violated the most fundamental tenet of appropriations law. In February 2015, alongside the Committee on Ways and Means, this committee launched an investigation into the administration's actions. The committee's investigation sought to understand the facts surrounding the administration's decision to fund the CSR program through a permanent appropriation. Our questions were straightforward and included when and how this decision was made and who made it. From the onset, the administration has refused to cooperate with the committee investigation, but despite the administration's relentless efforts to obstruct our necessary investigation, we were able to shed some light on the administration's decision. The details and findings from the committee investigation are outlined in our joint report that was released yesterday, and I believe this is the report. You should all have that. The administration's position essentially boils down to this. Don't judge my actions, judge my intentions. The President swore an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. As members of Congress, we've each done the same. Again, this administration seems to believe it's above the law, and let me be clear, none of us are. This decision is not about the merits of the Affordable Care Act or the ability to provide health care for anyone. I certainly believe we should be doing some to help those, particularly those who are low income, who struggle for health issues. But this is about a constitutional question, and will this committee and this Congress uphold the Constitution or look the other way? No matter your position on the merits of the Affordable Care Act, we should all agree that we all must follow the law. Today's hearing will examine the consequences of the findings from the committee's investigation into the administration's decision to unconstitutionally fund the CSR program through a permanent appropriation. These consequences are widespread and they impact the ACA, they impact appropriations law, and they impact congressional oversight. The Obama administration's actions with respect to the CSR program are part of the broader pattern. There are clear problems with the law if the administration must violate the Constitution to keep the law afloat. And it's not just a CSR program, there are also problems with the transitional reinsurance program, the risk corridors, the basic health program, the list goes on. There are broad, constitutional, broad institutional concerns at play here. The Constitution clearly states that the power of the purse lies not with the executive but with congressional branch. This provides Congress an important check on the executive branch and that applies to any president of any party at any time. The president's claim of appropriations by inference, however, turns the Constitution on its head and threatens its important power of Congress. Finally, we as an institution must confront the executive branch's position that can dictate the terms of our oversight. Oversight is critical to a functioning democracy, and that is why the Constitution grants Congress extensive authority to oversee and investigate executive branch activities. It's how we improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the laws and how we eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse from government. As our report makes clear, the executive branch has gone to great lengths to keep information about the cost-sharing reduction program from Congress and therefore from the American people. If they think what they are doing is legal, then I invite them to come before this committee and explain it. The subcommittee cannot or will not accept uh, any, uh, any, any witness tactics that to delay and deny. In fact, again today, we have another instance of the administration's obstruction. The committee invited Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Burwell or a designee of her choosing 
to attend today's hearing, but the department has failed to provide anyone. For the alleged most transparent administration in history, this administration is trying its utmost to avoid congressional scrutiny, and that begs the question, is someone trying to hide something? I want to thank our esteemed panel of witnesses for appearing today. We look forward to listening to your expert opinions on the consequences of the administration's actions. Um, and before I recognize the um, ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Gett, I, I want to personally thank this committee for what was done uh, for mental health reform, particularly my friend, Mr. Gett, and everybody here steadfast uh, in, in investigating a very important question of this nation. Uh, the, the, the chair, the vice chair of the full committee, uh, the ranking members, uh, is, is powerful what came through, and I personally want to thank you for that. But now I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Gett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and thanks for your praise on the mental health bill. It really was a joint effort. There were a lot of bumps in the roads and difficult negotiations. That's an example of what this committee can do when we really work together. And as I said, in this committee and on the floor, it's a really good first step. Now we need funding, and I think we all we all know that. Um, unfortunately, today's hearing is not a productive hearing like all of our mental health hearings were, and it's it's really not intended to improve the ACA or to improve the um, affordability of health care for middle income and low income people. It's yet another hearing to bash the administration as they tried to do their best to implement, uh, well, to enact and implement the Affordable Care Act. Just for the record, it's the 17th hearing that this subcommittee has had since the ACA was passed into law in 2010. In Congress alone, nearly one-fifth of the hearings that we've had in this subcommittee have focused on ACA oversight. As I've said repeatedly in my various statements in this committee, I wouldn't mind that if there actually was an attempt to do something to improve the way the ACA works. Now, um, obviously, we try to enact constitutional legislation in this Congress. That's our job. That's the, the, the thing we were um, sworn to uphold. But we do have a judicial branch, which is um, there to give checks and balances just in case people get it wrong. And in this case, the House Republicans decided that they thought the CSR program was unconstitutional. Well, it's not this committee's job to determine whether this, th this program's unconstitutional or not. It's the court's job. And guess what? The House Republicans filed a lawsuit in federal court. They asked the judge to decide between conflicting interpretations of the law. And guess what? The trial court judge actually chose to rule on the merits of the case, and the judge ruled for the House Republicans and said, in fact, um, according to that pos judge's position, the, um, the, the, uh, this provision of the ACA was not constitutional. And now the administration's appealing that decision. So what are we doing here today? This matter is in the courts. Now, I'm not here to say whether it's my opinion, even though I am a lawyer, about whether this is constitutional or not. But I will say that everything I knew in the deliberation of this bill was everybody believed this provision to be constitutional. And so, once again, we're having this oversight where we're hauling in the administration, we're hauling in other people to talk about whether this provision, this cost-sharing reduction program, is constitutional or not, but in fact what we should be talking about is what are we going to do to improve the ACA so that the middle class and lower income taxpayers can afford health care. Mr. Chairman, I was, I was glad to hear you say that um, it's not about the merits of health care or provision of health care to low income people, but isn't that really what we should be worried about? Shouldn't we let the courts worry about the, uh, the, the ins and outs of the constitutionality? And in, in fact, the appeals court upholds the trial court decision. Shouldn't it be our job to try to figure out how to give some kind of subsidies or other offsets to middle and low income people so they can afford health care? Um, there's nothing I've seen since 2009 to indicate that there was any ill will on behalf of the administration with respect to 
um, the low cost fund or the cost sharing reduction program. There's no, no indication that the administration knowingly violated the Constitution. They, in fact, thought that it was constitutional. So why are we here? Once again, we're here to bash the ACA, to rake the administration through the mud, and to con continue to question this policy. I think it would be much more useful for this committee to look at legislation or to look at policies that would help fix this program and help make it affordable to get health care. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen, I yield back, and I recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Again, kudos on mental health. It was a great effort, and uh, remember, it passed our full committee 53 to nothing, so that's not a bad mark. So it was nearly 18 months ago when former Ways and Means Chair Paul Ryan and I sent our first letter to the administration requesting documents and information about the source of funding for the health law cost-sharing reduction CSR program. Chairman Brady now continued on with me in this investigation uh, after he became Chairman of Ways and Means uh, late last year, and we believe then and still believe today that the President illegally and unconstitutionally funded this program through a permanent appropriation used primarily to pay back tax refunds. Over the course of the investigation, we've sent more than a dozen letters and interviewed just as many administration officials. We've been forced to issue subpoenas to the administration for documents on the issue. I sent three subpoenas myself, and we've learned a lot during this time, despite the unprecedented obstruction from this administration. But there are even basic facts that the administration is still withholding from the Congress. Yesterday, the majority staff of, the, of this committee, along with the majority staff of Ways and Means, released this report detailing our investigation. We did it because folks at home, it's my state of Michigan, but frankly across the country and elsewhere, deserve to know how the government is spending their hard-earned tax dollars. And we're taking billions, talking billions in this instance. The, the federal government has an obligation to each and every taxpayer to spend the money with full transparency in accordance with the law. And when it comes to the CSR program, I'm sorry to say that the federal government has failed to do so. This administration has gone to great lengths to prop up the health law, going as far to break its signature law to keep it afloat. And here, the administration won't even give Congress the documents or the testimony that we need to fully understand how they came to the decisions that they made to fund the program, in my view, illegally. Without access to the information from the executive branch, we cannot conduct effective oversight. Without effective oversight, we can't protect the public's interest. Last month, I proudly joined my colleagues in introducing our proposal to replace the Affordable Care Act once and for all. I believe that our plan offers a better way forward, one that makes important changes to our health care system to improve access and also decrease cost, and a way that won't require the federal government to secretly shuffle around billions of dollars and violate the law like we've seen this administration do from our report with the Affordable Care Act. Yesterday's hearing of Ways and Means Oversight Subcommittee focused on the extensive findings detailed in this report. Today, we're here to talk about the long-term implications of those findings. Our findings go far beyond the CSR program and are important to the future of the Affordable Care Act, appropriation laws and principles, and even our institutional powers in the legislative branch. We did invite Secretary Burwell to attend or provide a witness for today's hearing, and I'm disappointed that they declined our invitation to testify. We deserve answers, and we're not going to rest. Our work continues, and I yield to Dr. Burgess the balance of my time. And I thank the chairman for yielding, and, and I certainly want to second his comment about the Department of Health and Human Services owed us the presence of the secretary or an appropriate designee to continue to investigate this issue. As we've discovered, this administration has disregarded the Constitution by taking and transferring money from the authorized and funded premium tax credit account to the cost sharing reduction program. Throughout this committee's investigation, the administration has gone to unprecedented lengths to delay providing this information, often citing non-existent legal privileges. If the administration's rationale for withholding information is accepted, we risk exempting the entire ex executive branch from congressional oversight. 
This trend toward an all-powerful administration must not continue in the next administration. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses that we do have today about the importance of transparency and oversight and what this con uh, committee might do to further prevent this type of activity in the future. And I yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman for yielding and to the answer as to why we are here today. We, as Congress, have oversight, and that is exactly what we have do, are doing because we have found that there is money that is being reprogrammed and shifted, as Dr. Burgess said, from one account to another without our agreement and appropriation. It is called Article I powers. We are talking, as Chairman Upton said, about billions of dollars. It is inappropriate. We should be doing the oversight and making the determination of what is happening with these dollars. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank you. And now I recognize uh, Mr. Green of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's my job to uh, give our ranking member's statement today because I think he's locked down in the Capitol. But before we do that, um, the issue of litigation brought by the Republican majority, it's not unusual that a litigant would, would not show up and not come to a hearing while you're in the court process. We know the district court made a ruling and that's on appeal. So uh, I don't think there's any problem with uh, somebody from the administration not showing up simply because uh, we can decide, you know, we, can, we have an opinion between all of us on what's constitutional, but that doesn't matter. The folks who make that decision sit in the black robes over in the Supreme Court building. So uh, I don't think there's any problem with the administration not showing up because uh, since the litigation was brought by the majority and let's let the courts work its way uh, through that. Um, but now I'll go to my colleague's opening statement. When we passed the Affordable Care Act into law over six years ago, we dramatically changed the health care landscape in the United States. The law has made access to comprehensive affordable health care a reality for the American people. At the close of the third open enrollment earlier this year, nearly 13 million people had selected health plans or had been re-enrolled in quality affordable health insurance through the federal or state exchanges. The in uninsured rate has fallen to a historic low and estimated 10 to 20 million previously uninsured adults have gained coverage since the passage of the bill in 2010. To help limit health care costs to consumers, the law includes several mechanisms like the cost sharing reduction of the CSR program, assist low and middle income Americans afford their deductibles, co-payments and co-insurance. CSRs are also help that ensure that out-of-pocket health care costs that do not place a crippling financial burden on American families. Many health care enrollees have taken advantage of the benefits offered by the CSR program of the approximately 11.1 million consumers who were enrolled at the end of March of this year, 57% or nearly 6.4 million individuals were benefiting from the CSRs to make their coverage more affordable. The CSR program has uh, proven effective at accomplishing what it's designed to do. One study estimates that Americans who are eligible for cost sharing reductions would save an average of $479 each year. Yet if you listen to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, you would hear nothing about the benefits of the CSR program or about the Affordable Care Act at all. And, but despite the overwhelming success of the law, this committee has chosen to hold yet another hearing to attack and undermine the Affordable Care Act. This is nothing new. The Republican majority spent six years promising to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, but we have yet to see a meaningful piece of legislation, and I might add, until the last week. They recently unveiled a plan that falls laughably short in pro providing quality, affordable coverage for our constituents and their constituents. This, the, those watching this hearing need to understand that the Republican majority is exclusively focused on taking down the Affordable Care Act. They have now voted 64 times to undermine or repeal the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act. Uh, they've held hearings, sent letters, document requests, conducted interviews, and issued subpoenas. They have filed an unprecedented lawsuit in federal court to challenge the cost sharing reduction program. There are certain ways we could be conducting meaningful oversight of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm sure we could come together and improve the law and enhance the coverage and options available to our constituents. But this hearing and this investigation uh, is, will do no such thing. 
Hearings like this only serve to hurt Americans, reverse the progress that's been made for millions who now benefit from the law, and it's time our Republicans to stop litigating the past and to work with us to continue improving the health care quality of the country. And I, anybody else want time or a minute? Well, I think the gentleman for yielding. Being a former state senator, I could continue to talk for a minute, but I'd be glad to yield back. <laughs> well, well, Senator, I understand, having been a senator myself, I understand that senators are given unlimited time to speak, and they always manage to exceed it. Right. So, but thank you. I ask unanimous consent that the members' written opening statements be introduced into the record, and without objection, the documents will be entered into the record. I'd now like to introduce the witnesses for today's hearing. First, we have Mr. Doug Badger, who will lead off our panel. Mr. Badger is a former White House and senior U.S. Senate Policy Advisor, currently a senior fellow at the Galen Institute. We thank Mr. Badger for being with us today, and we look forward to his comments. We also want to welcome Mr. Tom Miller, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Miller studies health care policy, including health insurance and market-based alternatives to the Affordable Care Act. Thanks to Mr. Miller for appearing before us today, and we appreciate your testimony. Next, we welcome legislative consultant Mr. Morton Rosenberg for over 35 years. Mr. Rosenberg was a specialist in the American public with the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service, where, among other topics, he focused on the scope and application of congressional oversight and investigative prerogatives. He's been in the forefront of these issues, and we appreciate him being here today and offering his testimony on this important issue. And finally, I'd like to introduce Mr. Simon Lazarus, who is senior counsel at the Constitutional Accountability Center. We thank you for being with us today. I want to, again, thank all of our witnesses. It's quite an esteemed panel with probably a century or more of, uh, of experience, so we look forward to hearing from you. Now, you're all aware this committee is holding an investigative hearing, and when so doing, has had the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do any of you have any objections to taking testimony under oath? Seeing no objections, the chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you are entitled to be advised by counsel. Do any of you desire to be advised by counsel today? And seeing no request for that, in that case, would you please rise and raise your right hand, and I'll swear you in. Do you all swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You are now all under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. We'll ask you each for a five-minute summary of your written statement because we're on a tight time schedule. I hope you'll pay attention to the yellow and red lights there. Mr. Badger, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member DeGette, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to appear before you this morning to discuss the Affordable Care Act's cost-sharing reduction program. Implementation of that program has been irresponsible, unaccountable, and at its heart, unlawful. It is part of a pattern of malfeasance in ACA implementation occasioned by a serious miscalculation of demand for health insurance among young and relatively healthy people. This miscalculation led to a series of decisions by senior officials at the Departments of Treasury and Health and Human Services during 2014 that ranged from the reckless to the illegal. My colleagues, Brian Blaze of the Mercatus Center, Edmund Heiselmeyer at the Heritage Foundation, Seth Chandler at the University of Houston, and I have published two studies of insurer performance in the 2000 benefit year. Our first study provided information on how insurers fared selling individual qualified health plans, QHPs. We found that corporate welfare payments made to these plans in the form of reinsurance payments uh, and risk card or claims averaged more than $1,100 per enrollee, or 25% of premium. Put another way, had risk card or payments been made in full, insurers would have received $1.25 in revenue for every dollar they collected in premiums and still lost money. Our second paper examined the relative performance of the 174 issuers that sold QHPs in both the individual and small group markets. We found that insurers lost nearly three times as much per enrollee uh, selling QHPs to individuals than they did to small groups. Those losses occurred despite billions of dollars in individual and corporate subsidies that were available for individual QHPs, but not for group QHPs. The main reason individual QHP enrollees incurred medical claims that averaged 24% more per enrollee than for group QHPs. Those claims consumed 110% of premium dollars. These losses continued after 2014, 
McKinsey and Company estimates that they may have more than doubled in 2015. Now, why has this happened? Uh, Brian Blaze of the Mercatus Center, I think, uh, has laid out why the rules governing the individual QHPs have produced such disastrous results for insurers that billions in lawful and unlawful corporate subsidies cannot cure. He said, quote, the ACA largely replaced risk-based insurance in the individual market with income redistribution based on age, income, and health status, end quote. Whatever the merits of the redistribution of wealth, Congress cannot redistribute health. The ACA's rule structure for the individual market seeks to do this by requiring insurers to sell products that are generally unattractive to younger and healthier people and overcharge them for those products while discounting premiums for people who are older and less healthy. The result is a so-called market that attracts high-risk enrollees and repels low-risk ones. Such a market is incurably dysfunctional. As this began to dawn on administration officials during 2014, they made a series of sudden policy reversals to entice insurers to remain in exchanges. These included the expenditures of unappropriated money on the CSR program, the diversion of billions of dollars from the Treasury to insurance companies through the reinsurance program, repeated restructuring of the reinsurance program to make payments 40% more generous to insurers than at the time they submitted their premiums, and a slow retreat from the agency's prior position on risk card or budget neutrality, an effort to turn it into a TARP-like fund that forces taxpayers to bear the costs of bad business decisions made by big corporations. This committee has been diligent in calling attention to these actions, and Congress has acted to assure that the risk harder program acts as, operates as intended. Further action is required to end the unlawful diversion of funds from Treasury through the reinsurance program and to ensure that lawsuits filed by insurers do not render Congress's budget neutrality risk corridor requirement meaningless. The health care reform law is not working in the individual market. The unlawful payment of corporate subsidies cannot fix it. I'm encouraged by the remarks of uh, Ranking Member DeGette and by the Chairman. Uh, I agree that Congress should repair the health care reform law, but it should not overlook unlawful improvisations that try to, discard, to try to disguise its deficiencies. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller, recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Murphy, uh, subcommittee ranking member DeGette, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today on the Obama administration's funding decisions regarding the cost sharing reduction program under the Affordable Care Act. The federal district court ruling in House v. Burwell reaffirmed the longstanding rules of appropriations law. Advance payments to insurers to reimburse their expenses in providing cost sharing reductions mandated by the ACA were never appropriated by Congress. Hence, they could not be spent by the Obama administration. All appropriations must be expressly stated. Uh, they cannot be inferred or implied. The ACA does not designate a source of funds to make the cost-sharing reimbursements. The administration has offered a number of legal rationales to try to find authority for its decision to continue funding of the CSR payments. But as Judge Collier in House v. Burwell concluded, the plain text of the ACA outweighed those arguments in most cases when other important textual distinctions did not already. The administration's overly broad approach to inferring permanent appropriations by Congress in this case would provide no limiting principle to prevent future administrations from paying for virtually any ACA program on the theory that it is linked somehow to premium tax credits under Section 1401 of the law. It is this Congress and future ones uh, that is the constitutionally designated branch of the federal government that must decide whether or how to appropriate funds for CSR payments to insurers. This particular legal controversy needs to be placed within a larger and disturbing context. For the last six years, the Obama administration has been frustrated by its inability to get Congress to support more funding for a number of its less popular objectives under the ACA. It keeps trying to stretch appropriations law and administrative guidance to spend money without necessary consent or authority. The administration has a lengthy rap sheet in bypassing the Constitution, statutory law, and norms of administrative law. 
Its transgressions and evasions have essentially challenged opponents to just go ahead and sue in court if they want to uphold the law. But this pattern of conduct seriously undermines the minimum level of respect we need for and from our government agencies and officials. Laws passed by Congress are not just mere suggestions to be subjectively, selectively revised or discarded by the executive branch. Elections do matter, and so do the decisions by the elected representatives of Congress they empower. Trust in the basic integrity of our government institutions and their adherence to the rule of law is a key foundation of democratic accountability, civil discourse, and economic progress. And if we are ever going to reduce the partisan rancor and operational gridlock in remedying the long list of dysfunctional components of the ACA, taking illegal shortcuts and making expedient administrative revisions in the law must be replaced by offering a more persuasive case for whatever legislative changes in the underlying statute are necessary, and then facilitating actual votes in Congress to do so. But until then, this subcommittee's continuing investigation and oversight of the executive branch's policies and practices in this area remain essential to maintaining political accountability and the rule of law. I submitted my written testimony earlier this week before the extraordinary joint congressional investigative report into the source of funding for the ACA's cost-sharing reduction program was available for review and comment. It carefully and meticulously details how the administration first abused and raided another permanent appropriation in order to pay for the cost-sharing reduction program and then obstructed the work of several congressional committees to investigate its actions. We have learned over the years that not every serious abuse of executive branch power in implementing the ACA differently than the law passed by Congress can or will be remedied in court. But at a minimum, the American people need to know more about how officials execute the laws that control taxpayer funds and shape so many vital aspects of their lives in order to hold them politically accountable in our representative form of government. I hope and expect that today's oversight and investigation hearing will further that objective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Now, Mr. Rosenberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Just make sure your mic's on and you pull it close to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Could you turn your microphone on? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. pleased to be here, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, this is a welcome return uh, to be before a committee that I learned whatever I think I know uh, about investigative oversight from legendary chairmen like uh, John Moss and uh, John Dingell and their great staffs. I did more work for this committee between 1975 and 2005 than I did for any other committee in the Congress. And if I had to boil down the essence of what I've learned about oversight, it would be this. Committees wishing to engage in successful oversight must establish their credibility with the White House and the executive departments and agencies that they oversee early, often, and consistency, consistently, and in a manner evoking respect, if not fear. Although your, uh, the standing committees and special committees have been vested with an array of very formidable tools and rules to support their powers of inquiry, it is absolutely critical to the success of the investigative power that there be a credible threat of meaningful consequences for refusal to provide necessary information in a timely manner. In the past, that threat has been the possibility of a citation of criminal contempt of Congress, or even earlier in our history, a trial at the bar of the House, either of which could result in imprisonment. There can be little doubt that such threats were effective in the past, at least until 2002. Between 1975 and 1998, there were 10 votes to hold cabinet level officials in contempt uh, of Congress. Four of those votes came from this committee and were very effective in getting uh, uh, information. Indeed, the first two votes, which were the first two votes ever to hold uh, cabinet level uh, officials in, in, uh, in contempt, involved an issue that is raised here. It involved uh, uh, two statutes that had non-compliant uh, uh, and uh, uh, confidentiality provisions. 
And the heads of each of those departments, uh, the Commerce Department in 1975 and the HEW in 1978, claimed that uh, a broad non-disclosure provision applied to Congress. John Morse uh, challenged that in both cases, and in both cases, uh, uh, votes, preliminary votes of contempt, you know, in, in the subcommittee were sufficient to have the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the documents released and the testimony given that was brought. And similar things happened during the early 80s under John Dingell. Uh, as I said, all of these 10 result in one way or another uh, of substantial compliance with information demands in question before the necessity of any criminal trial. It was my sense that in those instances, that those instances established such a credible threat of a contempt action was possible that until in 2002, uh, even the threat of a subpoena uh, was often sufficient to move an agency to an accommodation with respect to document disclosures or the testimony of agency officials uh, and the White House to allow even uh, officials to, to, to testify without a subpoena. The last such instance uh, was the failed presidential claim of privilege during the chairmanship of Dan Burton in its 2002 investigation of two decades of informant corruption in the FBI's Boston office. I might add that it was a bipartisan effort in which the contempt vote was a virtual certainty. The current situation is that Congress is presently under a literal siege by the executive. The last decade has seen, among other significant challenges, an unlawful raid on, the con on a congressional office, Department of Justice prosecutions of members for success that successfully denied them speech or de debate protections, uh, presidential co-option of legislative agency rulemaking, among other things. But with respect to uh, 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 the, uh, investigative oversight, since 2000, since, and recently, uh, the executive branch has adopted a stance uh, of, uh, uh, which was first enunciated in, by the Department of Justice in 1984, that the historic congressional processes of criminal and inherent contempt designed to ensure compliance with its information gathering prerogative are unconstitutional and unavailable to a committee if the president unilaterally determines that such officials need not comply. Mr. Rosenberg, I just want to say, you're out of time. If you could just give a final statement, then I have to move on. Congress has to protect its, its investigative authority. Uh, the current uh, stance of the Justice Department means that every time you, s you issue a subpoena that, uh, for documents or testimony that is not going to be complied with, they're going to force you into district court. And forcing you into district court will mean delay and the possibility of aberrant judicial decisions, which has occurred in uh, the Myers case and in the present uh, fast and furious litigation, which in total with its investigative uh, time Thank you. and the time before the courts has gone on for five and a half years without resolution. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Lazarus, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think the uh, mic is now on. Um, as senior counsel to the Constitutional Accountability Center, I helped draft an amicus curiae brief, which uh, CAC filed in House of Representatives v. Burwell, which um, you referenced, Mr. Chairman. That brief was on behalf of, the Dem of Democratic leader Pelosi uh, and other leading members of the House Democratic Caucus. It supports the administration's determination that it has authority, it has authority to fund the Affordable Care Act cost-sharing provisions that are at issue in that case and in this hearing. And my sole narrow mission here uh, is to explain why. To begin with, as all of us here know, the cost-sharing uh, reductions program was designed uh, and has in practice operated as an integral component of the Affordable Care Act. However, uh, the House leadership and uh, uh, district court uh, for the District of Columbia judge contend that there is no appropriation for the cost-sharing reductions, even though, as they concede, 31 U.S.C. Section 1324 does provide a permanent appropriation for the law's complementary premium 
uh, Assistance Tax Credits Program. With respect, this assertion is at odds with the ACA's plan for restructuring individual insurance markets, with the mechanisms Congress designed to effectuate that plan, with textual provisions defining those mechanisms and how they are intended to operate, and with multiple other provisions which would make no sense under these ACA opponents' interpretation. The administration has determined that the premium tax credits and cost-sharing reductions are commonly funded by that permanent appropriation in 31 U.S.C. Section 1324. That interpretation, the administration's interpretation, suffers from none of the above fatal deficiencies and enables the act to operate as Congress intended. Just one year ago, in King v. Burwell, the Supreme Court rejected a similarly perverse uh, contrived interpretation, which in the words of uh, its architects was, was contrived to drive a stake through the heart of Obamacare. I believe at a conference at the American uh, Enterprise Institute, uh, I think that was stated. Um, uh, in that case, Chief Justice John Roberts held for a six-justice majority in terms which I think everyone interested uh, in how to interpret the provisions at issue here, the cost-sharing reductions provision, should read very carefully. He said Congress passed the Affordable Care Act to improve health insurance markets, not to destroy them. If at all possible, we must interpret the act in a way that is consistent with the former and avoids the latter. Section 36B can fairly be read consistent with what we see as Congress's plan, and that is the reading we adopt. One year later, ACA opponents have mounted a transparent rerun of the same strategy. Once again, they brandish an acontextual, hyper-literalist, uh, contrived interpretation, ignoring the statute as a whole, crafted to undo the statutory design and to yield results that are inconsistent with the ACA's plan for improving health insurance markets, precisely the sort of scenario that the court in King ruled out. The House leadership's argument is that Section ACA Section 1401, which prescribes the tax credits, specifically amends 31 U.S.C. Section 1324, whereas there's no such reference in Section 1402, which addresses the CSR subsidies. But this is a too narrow prism. The text and structure of the ACA overall make clear that the CSR subsidies and the premium assistance tax credits form a mutually interdependent package and that together both are critical to what the Supreme Court characterized as the ACA's series of interlocking return, re reforms. Excuse me. And I should also add uh, that the House leadership's narrow interpretation would generate as the department also explained, a cascading series of nonsensical results. Now, most nonsensical among these, and I think that uh, there are something like 40 of them, uh, 40 provisions which would make no sense under the, under the leadership's interpretation and the district court's interpretation. Most nonsensical, federal expenditures would actually increase, and from the same fund from which uh, the, the House leadership's uh, interpretation purports to save uh, taxpayer dollars, Chairman Upton is not here, and so I can't point this out to him, but um, the Department of Health and Human Services has determined that the net budget impact uh, of the district court's interpretation would cost the government, quote, billions of dollars higher annually, and I believe that my colleague... Sir, if you could just wrap up, because we're late and we need to get going. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm over. I didn't know that. I apologize. Um, so in sum, the administration has act, lawfully acted to provide intended benefits for the 6.4 million individuals currently receiving cost-sharing reductions. Withdrawing funding for that lifeline would flout the design of the ACA and the textual provisions which establish that design, which is why this latest effort to undermine health reform is no more likely to succeed than its predecessors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Of questions. Um, at the Ways and Means hearing yesterday, a Department of the Treasury official stated on the record, quote, if Congress doesn't want the monies appropriated, it could pass a law saying do not appropriate the monies from that account. Uh, Mr. Miller, there you are. 
Is that how appropriations laws are supposed to work, that Congress has to pass a law specifying how the executive branch cannot spend a specific account or appropriations? You may have heard me reference the idea of that which is not no, uh, permitted is allowed. Your, your, your question implies the answer, uh, Chairman Murphy. That's exactly the opposite as to what happens. It's trying to say we can spend whatever we want until you stop us, as opposed to it is the uh, role of Congress under the Constitution to first authorize and then appropriate the funding. Uh, what failing you, to yeah, say you, to Congress, you Congress. can't spend it is not the same thing as saying it was originally approved for spending. Thank you. Mr. Rosenberg, in the course of this investigation, the committee has really faced unprecedented obstruction. The administration has refused to comply with subpoenas issued by this committee and the Committee on Ways and Means, and has grossly restricted the testimony of important fact witnesses, has given us no legally cognizable uh, basis to do so. And one of the excuses given is that the House v. Burwell litigation prevents the administration from complying with our request. In your professional opinion, does the House lawsuit preclude the Congress from conducting oversight over the source of funds for the cost sharing reduction program? Yes or no? No. Okay. And, and why not? Because the Supreme Court has addressed this issue in at least two major cases. One of them, a, a Teapot Dome case called United States versus Sinclair. And that question specifically arose that uh, the, the witness got up and said, um, uh, I'm involved in a lawsuit that I'm going to have to testify at. I'm going to leave my testimony for that lawsuit. Uh, for that, he was held in contempt of Congress, uh, and the Supreme Court upheld it, saying there's no way that he can <laughs> avoid, uh, you know, the uh, the breadth of uh, and, and the need of Congress to, you know, to, to continue investigations into knowing what was going on there. A second case, some years later, you know, you know, it came to the same conclusion with regard to uh, a witness. Who, who claimed that uh, uh, the, the committee that, that uh, litigation that was going on this would uh, you know uh, co might cause him concern uh, and may even you know uh, reveal evidence that you know that he was criminally uh, you know uh, responsible. And the court said too bad. Well, let me ask in addition to that the, the administration has further refused to provide documents or testimony that include any internal or deliberative materials. Now, it claims it can withhold this information based on long-standing executive branch confidentiality interest. Is this a valid or a legal reason to withhold information from Congress? Yes, No. And why not? When Congress operates, uh, it, it, it has, uh, in practice, kept for itself the discretion to determine whether common law privileges, such as deliberative process, attorney-client privilege, work product pr privilege, will be recognized by the chair. Uh, indeed, your, you know, your uh, processes uh, of investigation and holding hearings and, uh, you know, is, is based on uh, the uh, the need and its ability uh, to get all the information possible, no matter what. Uh, the court, the the, the the court, Congress has not has the discretion whether or not to uh, uh, accept a claim of deliberative process. And, and it is entitled to know everything, and and under law. Uh, uh, that's the final word. So, Mr. Badger, uh, in, in expanding from your testimony too, why do you think the administration has taken these kind of positions that uh, where we see the executive branch bending the law or stretching it? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, if um, Chief Justice Roberts believes that the ACA has improved individual markets and not destroyed them, he doesn't get out much. Uh, what has happened is that this has turned into a dumpster fire for insurers, forcing them to rely on a series of unlawful subsidies, as I've laid out in, in my testimony. And again, I return to the, the ranking uh, member's opening remarks. The idea of honestly addressing these, I think, would be a very good approach for Congress to take. What happened was, as we moved into 2014, the administration realized what was happening 
insurers realized what was happening, and that caused a series of sudden imp regulatory improvisations of dubious legality to try to get more money to insurance companies mm -hmm. to keep them in the game. That has not worked. Thank you. I see I'm out of time. I'm going to now turn to Ms. Gett for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lazarus, as, as I read your um, biography, you're a constitutional law expert. Is that correct? Uh, I'll have to leave that expert part to Well, that's what you well, do. Right. Thank you. And, and in fact, you wrote the amicus brief on behalf of the, of the House Democrats that was filed with the court in this case. It's the subject I, of I this I helped case. write it. I was one of, one of three people. Okay. Um, so I want to ask you a couple of questions about your view of the administration's interpretation of the statutory provisions at, um, at issue here. The first thing is, um, I think I heard you say in your testimony that, um, that you believe the administration's position that the ACA uh, makes clear that the CSRs and the advanced premium tax credits are integral components of a single program that are both funded out of an explicit permanent appropriation of the statute. Is that correct? That is correct. And why do you believe that? Well, um, let's b try to be brief about it, but the administration has a perfectly coherent uh, interpretation of the statute, which uh, in my view is uh, clearly the most reasonable uh, inter- Ooh, excuse me. No, yeah, okay, go. The administration has- Ooh, you had it right. Just move the microphone The administration, closer, the yeah. administration has uh, a, a perfectly reasonable, well thought through uh, interpretation of uh, the uh, appropriation issue with respect to the cost uh, sharing reductions provisions. Um, it's outlined very clearly uh, in, in the Justice Department's briefs and, and uh, supporting briefs like ours. Um, just in brief. Okay. Let, let, me just, let me just stop you there and say now, because we've got your brief and we've got your right. testimony too. Now, um, as you know, the district court decision uh, went against your position and the administration pr position, correct? Well, the, yeah, yes, the, will work. The, the 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 district court really okay, finessed okay. the whole they're, issue. They're ruling. It, it they're ruling said, went against it you. It simply know. said that, that 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 there is no appropriation. It's therefore unconstitutional. And the case is up on appeal now. Is that correct? It's definitely on appeal. And and in your experience, some of these most of these uh, lawsuits that have been filed around the ACA have had a diversity of district court opinions, and many have been reversed on the appellate court that level. That's also true. And so is it your view that the administration has an excellent case on appeal? I, I believe that it has okay. an excellent case, both with respect to whether or not the House of Representatives uh, can, can claim that it has standing to bring the lawsuit, uh, and with respect to the merits. Uh, the, the underlying its merits. Interpretation. Now, you, um, you testified that uh, just a minute ago that the CSR fund um, has 6.4 million people receiving that benefit. Is that correct? It is correct that I so testified, and I, I got that information from, uh, a th I think, a report uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. And of those 6.4 million people, they're all middle class or lower class, because that's what the requirement for the fund is. Is that right? Well, they would have to have incomes that are between 100 and 250 percent of okay. the federal poverty level. Of the federal poverty level. Okay. Now, um, are you, and I, I know you're narrowly an expert on constitutional law, but as you wrote your amicus brief in this matter and as you've reviewed this, are you aware of any uh, proposal that is pending in Congress to replace this, this fund uh, the CSR program with something else? Are you aware of any pending no, I'm, legislation? No, I'm not aware, but I okay. would point out that Congress, uh, instead of wringing its hands, has every ability to uh, change the, 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 the law if it disagrees with the administration. Right. And, and in fact, what will happen if the lawsuit is, if the, if the um, trial court opinion is upheld by the Court of Appeals, the result of that will be that the CSR fund which um, benefits 6.4 million people will be struck down. Yes, it's a, it'll be a very complicated uh, process, uh, as my colleagues on the other side have, have, uh, have, have explained in, in, in their testimony, uh, but that will be the result. 
Yeah, so the result is, and so you're not aware of any pending legislation in Congress to fix this issue. No, I'm not. So if they win their lawsuit, then these people will lose their benefits. Um, I believe that that is true. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Now recognize Vice Chair of the Full Committee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Wonderful. I want to come to you, Mr. Miller, um, because you've looked at the report. You know that we find that CS, there are, the administration does not have the authority to do these payments, yet they go ahead and they do that. Um, so let's kind of go back to the legislation. In your opinion, does the ACA designate any source of funding for the cost sharing reduction program? No, it does not. The provisions which uh, provide for, uh, in effect, mandatory appropriations by linking it to some pre existing uh, list of those categories added the premium tax credits to that, but there's no language that links it to the cost sharing okay. reduction payments, and therefore there is not that appropriation. Can a program uh, or can money be appropriated by inference? <laughs> well, you can try in this administration, and it's tried that uh, pretty uh, extensively. Uh, but under our Constitution, you cannot do that. And under uh, standard appropriations law, which the uh, GAO has, has longstanding expertise in that area, uh, lays out uh, the general categories of how you appropriate. And what would the consequences be for an executive branch that chooses to appropriate money by inference? Well, there are several consequences. I, I don't know whether you mean legal consequences. I mean, first, they're getting a free ride. They're, they're able to basically run and that roughshod. that is we're doing oh, oh, oversight. Oh, that, 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 that's correct. Uh, and, and basically saying, we're going to do this until you can stop us. And that's why we're in this type of impasse. Where it's an unusual lawsuit by the House as an institution to have to go into court in order to assert its constitutional authority, and that's why they got the ruling they did. But as a general rule, uh, this has worked out in the political process. We're in a very unusual moment where, to oversimplify and carry on with my colleague Doug Badger, Congress passed a law that didn't work. Now, the executive branch decided they couldn't fix it or wouldn't fix it, and so we're stuck. They're making the law into something else than what it is and trying to appropriate money, which wasn't appropriated, as opposed to fixing the law, which would resolve it or at least bring the issue out more transparently in a political manner. So basically what they did, as you're saying, they passed something. They realized that it is not a workable program, much like we in Tennessee realized years ago that TennCare was not a workable program. It was established by an 1115 waiver. It was too expensive to afford. And a Democrat governor came in and completely reshaped it. It took 35.3% of the state budget by the year 2005. And he removed 300,000 people from the program and reshaped the drug program because of the number of scripts that were being written and said, this is not sustainable. The good thing there was we had a governor who would say, I'm going to be transparent in this and you need to know what this is going to cost you. They couldn't shift the money around and play a game of chess behind the curtain that nobody was going to see. So what they decided to do federally was say, oh my gosh, our theories don't work. We can't afford this. The insurance companies are going to bail on us. Let's start moving some money around here because this is too expensive to afford and we don't want egg on our face. Pretty much? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh Again, this is, uh, this is structure. Uh, to just respond to what uh, Mr. Lazarus was saying. This is not a rerun of King v. Burwell, which involved, although we differ in terms of how much statutory ambiguity there may or may not have been on that, mm -hmm. this is simply a, a, a core provision of the Constitution which says it's the role of Congress assigned to them to appropriate money. It's pretty straightforward. The law doesn't have to change if Congress votes tomorrow to appropriate funds for this. It decided not to. There's not any authority for that money to be spent. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, 
Approximately 20 million Americans have uh, gained coverage since the Affordable Care Act became law about six years ago. But my Republican colleagues continue to look for ways to pull the rug out from under these Americans. Uh, in addition to the over 64 votes to repeal the law, the Republicans in Congress have decided to sue, uh, targeting now the cost-sharing reductions that are a key part of ensuring that our neighbors back home have access to affordable health care. Now, the, the Affordable Care Act had a number of, uh, it's a complex law, it had a number of, of different components. Part of it was to end discrimination against our neighbors who had a pre-existing condition, like a, a cancer diagnosis or diabetes, so insurance companies could no longer block them from purchasing insurance. Another part of the law was intended to stabilize insurance markets because this was a fundamental change in the way people would purchase insurance, and especially if you have people with pre-existing conditions coming in, and I think everyone agrees to that. I would hope so, even though my Republican colleagues have said we're going to repeal the act in its entirety. It's important to have a stable insurance market, especially when they're state-based. And another import, important part of it was to ensure that our neighbors, you know, our working class neighbors who are doing everything right can go in and purchase a policy. Uh, this has been a remarkable improvement to the way things were handled in the past. Uh, I've, we've all talked to so many of our friends and neighbors that now have that stability in their life that they didn't have before. So of the approximately 11 million consumers who enrolled at the end of March of this year, including 1.6 million uh, Floridians, my neighbors at home, nearly 6.4 million individuals were benefiting from this cost-sharing reduction piece that helps make their coverage more affordable. And what that really means is that it makes the difference in whether or not they can get to see a doctor or nurse get the checkups they need or not. So, Mr. Lazarus, in your understanding, how does the cost-sharing reduction piece uh, fit within the broader mission of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, thank you. Um, the cost-sharing reduction enables people who have insurance uh, and who uh, got premium assistance tax credit uh, funding uh, to afford their insurance premiums, but people who could not afford actually uh, to purchase health care because the deductibles uh, and, and, and co-pays were too much for them to afford. The, the cost-sharing reductions enable those people to have confidence that they will be uh, able to actually use their insurance, and therefore it encourages them to, to, to purchase so it. These are, and without, these and without, are that, without that, uh, you, you, the, the act wouldn't work because, uh, as you just said, uh, insurers must accept people without respect to their, their health status. Um, and uh, unless uh, the pool uh, includes uh, an, uh, a large number of people, including healthy people, um, the, whole, the, the markets will, will be destabilized. So the cost-sharing reduction provisions are essential to uh, achieving that stabilization. So this is, a, this is kind of another tack that my Republican colleagues have taken in addition to the repeal votes. The Republican majority, Republicans in Congress, filed a lawsuit in federal court to undermine families' ability to purchase affordable insurance. And I was surprised about the lower court ruling. But let's be clear here that if the House Republicans prevail in this lawsuit, it's going to be our neighbors all across America who are hurt. Uh, Mr. Lazarus, if the House Republicans are successful here, what, what is the impact to families across America? And do you know, you know, out of all these 64 votes they've brought, there, there has not been a corresponding uh, plan to, to address their needs. We're just going to have many of our neighbors that are out of luck. They have been successful in pulling the rug out from under them, and they won't be able to find affordable insurance? Well, first of all, I, I, I would certainly not lose 
hope that the district court's uh, decision is going to be upheld. I think that the administration has a very powerful case uh, both on uh, whether or not the House has standing to get itself into court over this uh, and also on, on the merits of the administration's interpretation, which is a very compelling interpretation. Um, what I do know is I believe that something like 57% of all of the uh, people getting insurance on the exchanges, 57%, that's many millions of people, uh, are eligible for it and receiving the cost sharing reduction. So we're talking a about a lot of your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, uh, time's expired. I, I just want to say that uh, with regard to the, uh, I think there's some confusion about the CSR and also the premium tax credit. The administration admitted in the lawsuits uh, that beneficiaries get the CSR reduction regardless of whether or not the insurers are paid and regardless of whether or not the district court ruling is upheld on appeal. So. The CSR is a subsidy to insurance companies, and the premium tax credit goes directly to the people. I just want to make sure we have that on the record. Recognize Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I feel in many respects like a fish out of water on this. Uh, uh, I go back 40 years ago when Sam Irwin was in the Watergate thing and he, uh, uh, hearings, and, and he said, I'm just a country lawyer. Um, and uh, he had made some fairly profound remarks. Um, well, I'm just an engineer, uh, and I'm dealing with something that's a medical and a legal issue more than anything else. So I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying the conversation here with it, but uh, I, I'm, I'm caught with some of the discussion that we seem to be, from my perspective, um, more the ends justify the means. Um, I'm not sure that that's the way we're supposed to be doing it. Um, I, I don't think there's any question that people that are getting health care and medical benefits, are, that, that, that's a good thing for them. But how do we get there? How do we get there? I mean, I, 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 I made some mental notes to myself about food. Um, we could rush food to market, but if we bypass the FDA in the process to make sure that the food's approved, it was supposed to get to market, then we shouldn't do it, but they benefited from it. Same thing with medicine. We have a lot of medicine that could help people, but we need to follow the process to make sure that it's appropriate for them. I, I, I'm, I'm lost with this. I, it, it, it just harkens back again to the same thing we heard uh, a, a year or so ago, the, uh, the administration saying that he had no authority. He said it 22 times. I have no authority uh, to deal with this immigration issue, but then he just went ahead and did it. Uh, I, I know that back uh, uh, during the testimony, they said that, they, that there was a request, that the president put in a request for appropriation, just like he did on immigration. He, was, he, was, he, knew he needed to have authority to do it. Well, he asked for authority for appropriations, but it was denied, but he went ahead and did it anyway. And then he apparently with just said, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm curious of whether we have a rule of law a rule of man. I, I thought all the statements that we see on the walls around here, these are all the rules of law. So I, 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 I'm going to go back to this, I, I guess, to Rosenberg, perhaps. Um, if this, if Lazarus is right and this thing gets overturned, where do we go? Have, have we just opened the, the gates uh, to lack of control? Is there something in the appropriation process that we should be doing to prevent this from happening, if it's overturned, if it's upheld, then I think we're going to be okay because it's been, for, it's now, it appears that it will be clear you can't spend money that's not been appropriated or authorized, vice versa. What happens if they overturn it? What happens to us in our process? Can you elaborate a little on that, how we might, uh, what should we be doing, essentially, what should we be doing here in Congress then? Mr. Rosenberg. With regard to the appropriations process? Yeah, the whole thing. If, if this thing's overturned, what are we supposed to do? Get a new plan. <laughs> Get a new what? Pass laws. If, 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 if the problem is uh, there wasn't an appropriation and you think there should be an appropriation for it, pass it. But the, yeah. the, uh, you have to have a plan and you have to have you know, uh, the votes to do it. Okay. Mr. Miller, uh, same, same question. Uh, 
what should we, what should Congress be, be doing at this point? Well, we've tried to fix these problems in the past, and your uh, historical example is rather apt because there was a lot of controversy uh, in the 1970s, not only about uh, Watergate, but about the budget process. I remember working on impoundment authorities, and, and we passed the whole uh, Budget Act, which supposedly to, to deal with that. Uh, it encourages the worst instincts in, in, in both sides. Uh, you get into uh, trench warfare, where Congress would retaliate in various ways, not as effectively, uh, where you'd try to <laughs> you'd be shutting down the government, you'd be trying to hold other appropriations hostage, uh, and that just makes our politics descend into a worse example as who can get away with as much as possible. Uh, the, this is a fundamental legal, structural, constitutional issue here beyond what you prefer in, in, in health policy in particular. Uh, all parties need to be accountable in the broad daylight to say, here's what our argument is, we're voting for it, we're going to find out what, what happens and what the public will support. You can't do an end run around the process or you get this type of improvisation where the administration tries to run out in front of what the law says and then Congress has to play catch up. Thank you. I yield back my balance of my time. Gentleman yields back and now recognize Mr. Green for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lazarus, thank you for testifying, and, and I, I think your testimony clearly lays out why the Affordable Care Act includes what we call either permanent or mandatory appropriation uh, for the CSR program. And mandatory spending is not unusual. Um, we, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 did that, along with a bill we just recently passed this year for mandatory funding for the S-CHIP program and for the continuation of the, uh, the FQHC program. So Congress does that on, on at times. Uh, my Republican colleagues disagree with you and they disagree with the administration and claiming that the administration acted unlawfully in concluding it had the authority to fund the C CSR program without an annual appropriation. In fact, the, this lawsuit shows that uh, they even will be willing to go to court um, Mr. Lazarus, Congress has many tools at disposal when it disagrees with an agency on uh, policy. Is that correct? That is very definitely correct, uh, and uh, those tools are available to it r right now. Uh, this is uh, the sky is not falling, uh, Mr. Miller. This is a simple matter of a difference of interpretation uh, of, of, of the relevant uh, statutory provisions on the part of the administration and Congress. Uh, Congress can fix that in an instant if it wants to, if it wants to go on record uh, casting a vote to take these uh, uh, subsidies away from people who need them. Uh, Congress has actually done that in the uh, Affordable Care Act, and, and uh, we're all here very well aware of that, and is specifically the Risk cor Corridor Program, which has been a target of criticism from my colleagues uh, uh, on the right side here. Um, uh, and it, it has, uh, Congress has actually acted uh, to, uh, de to affirmatively deny uh, appropriations to fund that program. So um, you can uh, put your money where your mouth is or, or your votes are uh, if, if Congress wants to, and it shouldn't really be running to court uh, to, pr to uh, try to uh, uh, protect itself here. Well, some of my colleagues seem to claim victory on the legal issue because of the federal district court recently ruled in their favor. Uh, they suggest that the ruling's conclusive evidence uh, you know, being a lawyer, I know there's an appeals process. And uh, were you surprised by the district court's decision? Well, I wasn't surprised after uh, going to the oral argument, uh, frankly. But I was surprised. I, yes, I was surprised because I, um, the, the precedents are very clear uh, that um, there's no congressional standing simply to vet uh, uh, a disagreement uh, over implementation of a law uh, with 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 uh, the executive branch. Um, so I was very surprised that the court uh, ignored those precedents and, and granted standing. And do you expect the ultimate outcome of the case on the appeal? Uh, well, I, I, I believe that it's more likely than not that, uh, that on, on appeal uh, the, uh, uh, the decision will be reversed. But of course, I could be wrong about that. We, we have to wait and see what it is. Well, as a lawyer, I normally don't ask a question I don't have the answer to. But right. I want to ask the panel. Uh, doing health care policy for decades uh, with Republican and Democratic administrations, some way you have to find a way to encourage the private sector to take the, the poorest folks, the ones who have a lot of claims, and the CSR is part of that process. Uh, can any four of you think that over the period of time, whether it be the prescription drug plan of 2003 that encouraged 
insurance companies to cover poor seniors who took a lot of medications. And uh, I'd be glad in my one point, <laughs> one minute, 10 seconds. How did that happen? How did, was that dealt with in 2003? Well, Congressman, I represented the White House in negotiations on that. And, and the way it was done uh, was that it was a bipartisan process to, uh, to agree on the law. The difference here is. Oh, I, I would disagree. I was here, and it wasn't bipartisan. Uh, the, I will say on the Senate side. <laughs> on our side. Had, <laughs> on the Senate side, we did have uh, over 60 votes, and that required substantial Democratic well. support. But uh, uh, that they were part of the, the conference process. The, 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 the difference here, uh, Congressman, I don't want to be argumentative, but that this is not working. The, the, the reality is that despite all of these corporate subsidies, despite all of these changes that were made uh, during the first part of 2014 by the administration, some of which do appear to be unlawful, uh, the insurance companies are still losing money in the individual market. We haven't solved this problem yet. And what I would encourage, just to correct the record, of the 6.4 million who are getting these subsidies, even if the administration were to follow the law, Section 1402A2, says the issuer shall reduce cost sharing under the plan. The insurer has an obligation to do it, irrespective of the presence of these funds. But what I would hope that this would precipitate is the kind of conversation we had with respect to Part D, where people work together, acknowledge that this is not working in many ways, and try to work together on getting something that does. Well, in my last 15, 20 seconds, whatever I have, I agree with you. We need to work together to see how we can fix it because these folks need that health care coverage and in just dropping six million people off without this assistance. So hopefully in the majority uh, we can deal with that and and fix it instead of going to the court and uh, and you know the law needs to be successful so we need to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Griffith, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. This is an important hearing because it, it points out some major flaws and problems that we have in the way that Washington is currently working. Uh, I think it's high time, and this is a classic example of it, it's high time we start defending the legislative prerogative. It's not a matter of Democrat or Republican or Independent or Socialist or whatever party you want to put on there. It's a matter of defending the Constitution from the congressional branch, the legislative branch of our government. We aren't doing it. And uh, we should be doing it, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, as I said. And it's one of the reasons I really hope we'll have a Republican president so that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will see that if a Republican president were to flaunt the law as it has been flaunted in this particular circumstance and try to spend money not authorized by Congress, I will stand up and say to that president, just as I'm going to say today, you can't do that and we're not going to sit idly by and allow you to do that. Doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, whether it's a program I like or dislike, we've got to follow the law. And just yesterday, uh, you know, we are not robots here just doing things. Yesterday, I made an independent constitutional decision. We don't have to wait on the courts to tell us what is and isn't constitutional. We get to make some of those decisions ourselves. That's why we take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And I voted against a rule against my party because I thought paragraph five of the rule included something that I believe is unconstitutional. Now, all that getting off, that, off my chest, I have to say this as well. I think the 60-vote rule in the Senate is killing us. Mr. Lazarus, you said it's easy for us. We can just pass a law. We can in the House pass a law with a majority vote. You can't do that in the Senate. They've totally botched up the entire process. Again, doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. When it takes 60 of 100 votes to pass a piece of legislation, it's wrong. The process doesn't work, and it is weakening It is weakening the legislative branch of government and is dangerous to the republic. Mr. Rosenberg, you said to Mr. McKinley, if, we, if, we, uh, if this ruling is upheld and we now have to flip things around, where instead of voting for appropriations, we have to vote against appropriations and say you can't spend money here, the problem with just passing a law and having a new plan is that 60-vote rule in the Senate. There. I got all that off my chest, but I think it's very clear, just like in the Solyndra case where they didn't have authority to subrogate, then they subrogated and claimed that, you know, before lunch was different than after lunch because uh, it was, you know, an hour later you could subrogate because you weren't supposed to subrogate at the time of the initial loan, but you could come back later. It's the same kind of thing here. They're, they're interpreting the law in such a way. And when we take the position as a legislative branch of government, 
that we have to sit back and wait for the courts before we can take any action, we lose our authority and, we lo and it diminishes the legislative branch. Mr. Rosenberg, would you disagree with what I've just said? Not at all. And I appreciate that. Mr. Miller, would you disagree with what I've just said? No, and I would just underscore that what was unique about the House v. Burwell case is, we need to think about this. The judge knocked out a different complaint that the uh, House had about the employer mandate because that was a matter of statutory interpretation. However, this went to a core constitutional provision, the power of Congress to determine appropriations and spend money. And that's why it was uniquely moved forward and got past the standing considerations. There was really no other plaintiff you could have bring this case before a court. Uh, and, and that's why uh, the judge, in a very unusual ruling, said this is the only way to remedy this issue. And, and I think we may have some more of those, but, but first we have to, you know, stop looking at ourselves as playing for the Republican team or the Democrat team and start playing for the legislative branch of government, because if we follow the process in the legislative branch of government, we will end up with better government. I don't think that, uh, in due deference, Mr. Lazarus, I don't think that we can say we can flip it. I think that's bad for the Republic, too, where you say that since we didn't specifically uh, say they couldn't spend it, they can spend it. I, I think that's an error for the— Mr. Griffith, I could just add one thing you didn't mention. Beyond the 60 votes in the Senate, you've got a presidential veto. So you have an administration which could act illegally and then protect its illegal actions by vetoing correction by Congress to try to override it. Well, and that's true, although I respect the, the constitutional prerogative of the president to veto a bill, but at least if we could get it out of the Senate, we'd make him veto it because my position is the president won't veto everything you send him. If we send him 70 bills he doesn't like, we're going to get 10 or 15 of them at least past that veto pen. Uh, my time is almost up. Mr. Rosenberg, I'd love to get the sights on that Teapot Dome case that you cited earlier because I think that's important, again, as a part of a legislative prerogative. And that's really what this hearing is about. It's not about trying to take down the ACA. It's about the legislature defending its right to determine where it's going to spend money and where it's not going to spend money. And unfortunately, the administration has totally disregarded it, and we need to be more aggressive. My time is up, so unfortunately, I can't res in, let you respond. In my testimony on page five. On page five. All right. Very good. And uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Jimmy yields back. Recognize Ms. Clark for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank our expert witnesses for appearing here today. I just want to drill down a little bit more on some specifics with respect to the uh, CSR. Congress designed the ACA cost sharing reduction program to reduce out-of-pocket costs for certain enrollees, enrollees purchasing silver plans on the exchanges. Cost sharing subsidies along with advanced premium tax credits lower what beneficiaries pay for health insurance costs. Essentially, these discounts lower the amount of money consumers must pay out of pocket for deductibles, coinsurance, and copayments. The Department of the Treasury then reimburses insurance companies for making these cost sharing reductions. This is the basic premise. So, Mr. Lazarus, how is the mission of the cost sharing reduction program consistent with the broader goals of the Affordable Care Act. Thank you very much. The, the um, cost sharing reduction program is essential to the overall operational uh, plan of, of the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, it, it enables people who otherwise couldn't afford health care even, uh, e even with premium assistance to help pay their insurance premiums to get health care and therefore encourages them to actually buy insurance, they become part of the, uh, a larger insurance pool. Uh, that leads to the stabilization of markets uh, uh, and, it, and it enables the, uh, the, the markets to accommodate the fact that the law now forbids insurance companies from turning away people uh, if they have pre-existing uh, conditions and so forth. Um, so all of these uh, uh, components work together uh, just as the Supreme Court uh, ruled in, in King v. Burwell, um, and the cost-sharing reduction uh, provisions are, are absolutely integral to that. Uh, so that's, that, that's, that's how that, uh, that works. Thank you. Uh, since Congress passed the Affordable Care Act in 2010, the number of uninsured in the United States has fallen by 20 million people. Uh, this is a remarkable achievement, and such an achievement 
would not have been possible without ensuring that all elements of the law work together as designed to provide a stable and accessible insurance marketplace. In his opinion in King v. Burwell, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, quote, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act to improve health insurance markets, not to destroy them. If at all possible, we must interpret the act in a way that is consistent with the former and avoids the latter. Mr. Lazarus, can you apply this same reasoning to the CSR program? Well, I, I would uh, say that if you take the approach that Chief Justice uh, Roberts elaborated there, uh, he was applying it to the premium assistance tax credits uh, and stating that under that approach, uh, they, the, the law, an ambiguous provision in the law should be interpreted to make them applicable in all states, uh, rather, and not just in, in states which state with state-run exchanges. Um, I, I would say that the uh, uh, cost-sharing reductions uh, part uh, of the subsidies is on exactly the same footing as the premium assistance tax credits and would fit in into that analysis in, in the same way, and therefore the administration's interpretation uh, is, is the proper interpretation. Very well. well Mr. Chairman, we have heard today that the cost-sharing reduction program is a critical component of the Affordable Care Act, and it has played a very important role in the efforts to provide health care security for working Americans. To attempt to dismantle this program without providing any other way to ensure access to critical health care services to, disturb, to deserving Americans is frankly, I believe, irresponsible. And I hope we can move on from this partisan investigation to provide all of our constituents with the health care coverage that they need. And having said that, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you. Dr. Bashan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. As a health care provider, I just want to say I want every American to have access to quality, affordable health care. And that, I think, is a goal that we all share. But this was a bad law. It was passed in a bad way. Just remind everyone the law was a Senate bill that, uh, that uh, did not have the chance to go to conference because it would any change to the law would have resulted in its failure to pass Congress after a change in the makeup of the U.S. Senate. We all know that, and when you do those type of things, you end up with this. Uh, I'd also encourage everyone to look at our Better Way website, uh, House Republicans, and our proposal to replace uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Mr. Lazarus, does the ends justify the means? Do the ends justify the means? Yes. Uh, no, they don't. Okay, because essentially in your testimony, that's what you've said. No, it that does. is not no, what I It's my time. With all respect, that is not what Here's I'm what you said. You said because of what will happen if the district court decision is upheld, um, and our Democratic colleagues implied the same, that it should be overturned even if the Constitution is violated. That's essentially what you said. No, that is not what I said. What I said is that, the, administra what did you say? That, the, that the administration has a different interpretation uh, of its appropriation authority here, uh, that the administration's where, interpretation where, is perfectly sensible. Where, where, can you quote me in the Constitution where their interpretation is, where or it says in the Constitution that the only people that can appropriate money is the, con is the Congress. Can you tell me in the Constitution where it says that you can interpret that, that the administration that and the executive branch can appropriate money that's not, the Congress has not appropriated. The administration's position is that Congress has appropriated the money. Uh, your position is that it has not. So the district the court disagrees with you, so, uh, uh, you know, and the other thing is, is I want to just clear this up, and this could apply to any law, uh, but in this case, does it, because the law's intent is to provide insurance, to American citizens for health insurance, does it matter in your, in your, my, the gist of your testimony is, is it doesn't matter what the law actually says because the intent of the law is to provide coverage. That is not true. That is not at all. Because what that's I what said. you basically that's said. That's not what the administration is arguing. Uh, and again, this isn't a partisan issue. This is a legislative branch discussion versus an executive branch discussion. And it honestly, in fairness, has been a struggle for 240 years. But I agree with my colleagues that have said uh, that unless the legislative branch in a bipartisan way reasserts its authority, the future of the Constitution and this country is at risk. Um, well, I certainly agree that if, if, if you 
uh, believe that the administration's interpretation of its appropriations authority with respect to this program is incorrect, you should attempt to pass a law. Okay, the, the or other otherwise, thing, the, use your ample powers uh, to, to, to change that result. Now, you're you now let that. me just say this. You're a, part, you're a partisan supporter of the administration, and you know as well as I do, and you can say that because you know the president would just veto anything related to the Affordable Care Act, and we don't have the override vote. So it's pretty easy to say that, right? But I would like to know what you were saying back when Republicans had 60 votes in the Senate, the House, and the White House. I think your view would be a little different. But the, the other thing I want to get at is, 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 it, is it in this is, does it matter if a law makes sense to make it enforceable? I mean, obviously the constitutional provision of appropriations doesn't make sense to you in this case. But does that matter? If to make, does it mean that we can't enforce it because it doesn't make sense to you? The constitutional uh, provision uh, about uh, uh, I mean, you, no, you no, said in your no testimony, revenue, no well, that doesn't make any sense because, makes perfect sense because people are going to lose their health insurance if we don't do this. The ends, that's implying the ends justifies the means. It implies that the Constitution doesn't matter. It implies that it doesn't matter why we oppose the Affordable Care Act. Or that, in your interpretation, that doesn't make any that just doesn't make any sense. That none of that matters, right? What matters is is what the Constitution says about appropriating money. And the district court, at this point, I would argue that I don't think it's going to be overturned because historically, Congress has been found to have standing in this in this to to sue the administration based on our congressional appropriations. And I would hold that we were we are going to win that. And I would also say that 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 uh, people on both sides of the aisle, on the, in the legislative branch, who should continue to argue uh, that this is in the Constitution and it's our sole authority to appropriate money. It doesn't matter what it's for. It doesn't matter what law it pertains to. I yield back. I just want to clarify that the administration, in 2014, asked for an appropriations for this. If what you're saying is true, they didn't have to, that belies what they did. So in fact, that's true. The second thing is the Department of the Treasury said there's currently no appropriation to Treasury or to anyone else for purposes of cost sharing payments. I just want to say that's in the reporter. So I just wanted to clarify that for, Ms. for Dr. Bouchon. Mr. Chairman, if yes. you're going to do that, you should let him respond. Yeah, let him respond. Statement. Yes, I'm, I'm perfectly aware that the administration did request an appropriation. Um, but that has often, uh, or at least it has sometimes happened, that, that, that uh, uh, an administration will request uh, congressional uh, action in an area where it's unclear whether or not uh, the, the executive branch has authority to act on its own. So, uh, so it happens all the time. And the, the only question here is whether, in fact, the administration's interpretation of its authority uh, is correct or is not correct. Well, the, along those lines. If you can get us examples of that and show me where, show this committee where in the Affordable Care Act it gives that author. I mean, you just said it was unclear, but also the Treasury said it was not. Treasury said there is currently no appropriation of Treasury or anyone else for the purpose of the cost sharing payments. So you're saying it was unclear to the administration. They asked for the money. We're just saying for this committee, if you could show us the lines in the Affordable Care Act, we gave the automatic preauthorization for the future of this and also um, or the appropriations. And if you could respond to the statement of the Treasury, this committee would appreciate that. Okay, just two points. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the first point is it's hardly surprising that there uh, was disagreement within the administration uh, over this issue. Um, that often happens. Uh, but what matters now is whether or not the uh, position that the administration has finally uh, and, and uh, with, with careful attention taken, whether that position is correct or not. Now, the position... Uh, is wait wait I just want to make sure I understand the administration they took a position whether or not it, that is correct yeah whether whether said. whether it's correct I mean well that's what this committee is trying to find out sir you don't get to take a position and then retrospect well just, you, you ask me you okay know, where, where in the Affordable Care Act uh, does the uh, authority to spend this money uh, come from the administration's interpretation uh, is that within the integrated program that includes both the, the uh, uh, cost sharing reductions and the premium assistance tax credits within this integrated program, both, por both portions of the advanced payments to insurers to cover those uh, two uh, halves of the program are, quote, refunds due from Section 36B 
within the meaning of 31 U.S.C. Section 1324 because both are con compensatory payments to the insurers made available through the application of Section 36B, which sets forth uh, conditions necessarily necessary to qualify for both of those subsidies. That's the administration's textual interpretation. Uh, uh, I think that it, I think that it is perfectly perfectly reasonable interpretation. You may disagree, but that's what I, I need to let other members continue on. Mr. Tonko, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do not want. Or I do thank our witnesses for being here today, but I regret that uh, we're in a sense wasting your time to re-examine an issue that has been examined to death. This issue fundamentally comes down to a difference of opinion about what was intended by the Affordable Care Act with regard to the CSR program. Yesterday, the majority released a 150-page report with the Ways and Means Committee documenting in great detail their opinion on the legality of an appropriation for the CSR program. So, Mr. Lazarus, in your opinion, is it responsible to conclude that the ACA provides a permanent appropriation for the CSR program? I, I believe that it's correct. I understand that there's a, uh, a, a, an argument, a, a, a good argument for the opposite point of view, and I respect that, but I, I believe that is not only uh, uh, responsible, but that it's legally correct. And my Republican colleagues also claim that the administration has, quote, overreached in ex executing the CSR provision of the Affordable Care Act. Mr. Lazarus, would you agree with that assessment? I not only would not agree, but I, I think that the constant uh, din of charges uh, coming from the president's political opponents, that he's, con that he's overreaching, uh, uh, violating uh, laws, uh, is a very unfortunate uh, uh, d distortion uh, uh, of the truth. Uh, we, we must remember that prior to King v. Burwell last year, we heard the same litany of uh, uh, charges that uh, fu uh, funding uh, the premium assistance t uh, tax uh, credits in federal exchange states was a gross uh, violation of, of, of the law. And it turns out the Supreme Court didn't agree with that at all. Uh, but we're still hearing it, and we're hearing it over and over again. Uh, we, we heard it with respect to various uh, delays in the effective dates of parts of the Affordable Care Act as the administration implemented it. But uh, the truth is when uh, Part D of, uh, of uh, Medicare, the pre prescription drug benefit, which was a, uh, a President Bush program, and, and it turns out a very good program, I can personally testify to that, um, when it was implemented, there also were delays because it's very complicated implementing these very complicated laws. Uh, secretary uh, Levitt, who was uh, uh, the secretary of, of uh, HHS at the time, said that the, uh, the Obama administration's delays were, quote, wise, unquote. Um, so I, I think that uh, th this, this, uh, uh, th these charges of overreach uh, reflect a political strategy of demonizing this administration uh, rather than the facts. I thank you. In just a few minutes, we have concluded that a difference of opinion exists, yet it is reasonable to believe that the executive branch acted appropriately in executing the law. Now, my Republican colleagues have been examining this issue for two years without reaching that conclusion. Today's hearing follows the filing of a lawsuit in federal court questioning the uh, constitutionality of the CSR program. It follows 15 letters from the majority of this committee and from the Ways and Means Committee to administration officials. It follows six subpoenas for documents to three different federal agencies. It follows interviews with 13 current and former government officials from four federal agencies. And it follows a hearing yesterday by the Ways and Means Committee with four federal witnesses. So my question is, Congress clearly has a wealth of tools at its disposal. Mr. Lazarus, has Congress successfully used its legislative authority to uh, review or to re uh, reverse or defund the administration's implementation of the cost sharing reduction program? Well, I think that the fact that uh, Congress, that, that uh, Congress has, the Republicans have taken no steps to pass such legislation uh, is. Uh, uh, an eloquent, uh, a, 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 an eloquent testimony to, to the fact that they're failing to use those weapons and instead running to court as a kind of a diversionary tactic. I thank you for that assessment, and uh, I would just state enough is enough. After 64 votes on the floor, 
dozens of hearings and countless letters to the administration, it is clear that there is no purpose to this aimless oversight. I call on my Republican colleagues to move on to other important topics that deserve our time and attention and certainly respond much more appropriately to the general public that we serve. With that, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Now recognize Mr. Mullen for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the administration's position on the source of funding only changed after the sequestration report. Is, is that correct, Mr. Lazarus? I believe that it is correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Miller, would you mind explaining that a little bit more for us? Uh, uh, the, the, the timeline was first they requested the appropriation, then they also uh, filed uh, some information that is basically confirmed uh, that this would be subject to sequestration. They reversed direction on that uh, because it, it would be subject to sequestration because it's not a, a mandatory appropriation, which was uh, beyond just the, that single year, and that would have reduced the cost sharing uh, reduction payments. Right, uh, and the insurers was only going to get 92.8 cents on the dollar. Uh, there's an across-the-board haircut right. for those funds that are uh, subject to sequestration. I think the, the, the position that we're trying to take is that the timing on this it, it can't be cons uh, consent. Well, what's the word I'm looking for here? It, it, it's um, The timing on this just seems a little odd for us. Coincidental. There you go. Thank you. Uh, the Oklahoma accent wasn't allowed to be spit out. Uh, but it, it just seems odd to us. And, and the justification that's coming out behind this I have a hard time to, to believe it. Mr. Lathers, I, I appreciate your opinion on this, but it sounds like you're trying to justify the actions. And all we're trying to do is not keep poking the eye in this administration, even though we do that quite often. But who's hurting here? It's the insurers. It's the people that this was supposed to protect. I mean, in Oklahoma alone, the exchange has went up 49% this year alone. Insurance is, costs has skyrocketed through the roof. The same people that we were supposed to take by this law, it's hurting. It, don't take our word for it. Go out and see what, how much insurance is costing today versus what it cost in 2010 in six years. Something's wrong here. And that's all we're trying to do is fix it. We all have constituents. We all, we, we, we don't want anybody to go out there without insurance, but yet there already is. And, and with the cost rising the way that it is, why? Is just one piece of it? It's costing the taxpayers some dollars. We're the one holding the, holding the bucket full of dollars, I guess. But yet this is just one piece of it. And so, Mr. Eisler, I, I, I'm not really trying to come after you on this one. I'm just... I'm just disappointed in hearing you trying to justify the administration's actions and, thinks, and think for some reason it's political. It's not political at all. Mr. Miller, would you, would you like to respond a little bit more to what Mr. Lazarus was saying a while ago? Well, I could choose a lot of territory. Let me uh, raise one that hasn't been talked about. It's kind of the arguments that try to have it both ways. We have all this arguing in the alternative in court. Uh, we've heard that uh, people are going to be uh, suffering because uh, they won't be getting any cost-sharing reduction uh, subsidies. Well, actually, we know that they will still be required to do it. But even if that was the case, then they, they trying to have it both ways argument is to say, well, we'll just the insurers will just raise the premiums and the tax credits will be even larger for the premiums, so they'll all be covered anyway. Uh, it's one of these uh, migrating arguments where no matter what you do, uh, you end up in the same place. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, you're our congressional oversight expert. I mean, literally wrote the book on this. I know you've been asked what, you know, what we could do. I think your response was is that, uh, you know, pass legislation. Uh, we tried that. It doesn't work. We have this little guy in that keeps holding us up. Um, what else could we do here in Congress to help hold uh, this administration accountable to, to, to keep things that we feel like is completely outside their boundaries? We, everybody says we, ha we control the, burst, the purse strings. So in your opinion as the expert, what's our next step? Well, you've, you've got to shore up your abilities to know what's going on, to know how decisions are made, who makes them, and what's 
clear in your investigation, and it's been clear for the last five or six years in other investigations that uh, the doors have been closed on you. Uh, <laughs> Either slow walking, getting information, you know, it, that gives you the ability. The deliberately to, slow walking at all. Deliberately slow, slow walking and absolute refusals. And uh, when subpoenas are issued, they're ignored. And when you try to go uh, to, to do what traditionally has been done for 200 years, either uh, go for a criminal contempt to, to, to show that you, you mean what you say and we need what, what you're withholding from it, it's now impossible to do. Because what they're telling you is, well, if you want to do that, go to court for a civil action. And what that does is put everything on hold and we know that it takes up time and time uh, in a, uh, in uh, good oversight is an is is, is a necessity. It's a uh, you know timely getting the information so that it can be acted on so it would be effective is there. Thank you. The gentleman's time's expired. Now. I'm sorry, uh, my time's expired. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to try to explain that. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Schakowsky. Recognize for five minutes. So. Um, I really apologize for missing. There's all these conflicting things, but I appreciate all of you being here and do have a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Lazarus. But yesterday, the Ways and Means Committee held a hearing on this very same topic, cost-sharing reductions in front of representatives from HHS and Treasury and IRS and OMB. A member of that committee repeatedly declared, quote, this is not about poor people. This is about an insurance subsidy, unquote. I think this is simply disingenuous, just like the advanced premium tax credit, the cost sharing reductions are a direct benefit to consumers that simply throw, flow through the insurance companies. The average consumer benefiting from these cost sharing reductions receives approximately $500 per year and suggesting that it is an insurance subsidy I think is a cynical and misleading attempt to distract people from the reality that House Republicans are trying to take health care benefits away from low and middle income families. Will the gentle lady yield? No. We are it's not. This tells us all we need to know about the Republican Party's priorities. This investigation is not a good faith effort to improve the Affordable Care Act and ensure that all of our constituents receive quality, affordable health care. This is just a partisan witch hunt. Mr. Lazarus, the Affordable Care Act has now fa faced its fair share of challenges in the court. Does this lawsuit do anything to improve the quality of health care for the American people? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the lawsuit uh, is a very inappropriate lawsuit. I think that uh, um, it, it's a political uh, food fight uh, between the executive branch and, and part of the Congress. Uh, it doesn't belong in court. Uh, and I think that ultimately on appeal, that, that's the determination that uh, the courts are going to make. This law was passed to make health care about people, not about insurance companies. The Affordable Care Act has provided 20 million Americans with affordable health insurance and offered millions more protections against discrimination for pre-existing conditions, age, and gender. Of the approximately 11.1 million consumers who had effectuated enrollment at the end of March 2016, 57% or nearly 6.4 million individuals were benefiting from CSRs um, uh, to make coverage more affordable. Mr. Lazarus, what does the text of the law suggest about Congress's intent when the Affordable Care Act was passed? Is the way the administration has administered the cost-sharing reductions provision consistent with the broader reforms to the individual insurance marketplace and the American health care system? Well, <clears throat> yes. Uh, in, in brief, uh, the, the cost-sharing subsidies are an absolutely essential component to the other uh, uh, mechanisms that the Affordable Care Act uh, deploys in order to further its uh, goal of, of uh, uh, getting as close as, as possible to uh, universal insurance. Um, and uh, 
the, the statute is replete uh, with refer references to those purposes, uh, with the specific components uh, of the plan uh, that are necessary to achieve them, and it's uh, and it's and it's replete with specific references to the uh, importance of the of the cost sharing uh, uh, reductions uh, to achieving those purposes. Thank you for that, and it's clear that in passing the law, Congress's intent was to make it easier to access quality, affordable health coverage. And I believe the Republicans' partisan investigation only takes us further from that goal. The comments made yesterday were misleading, and they are disrespectful to the American people who are benefiting from the coverage provided through the law. Let me just say, too, over the years since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which was a very big and, I think, powerful and important law, we have attempted to sit down with the Republicans to come up with the kinds of fixes that on a bipartisan basis we, ha we could do. What I've seen is that all the bad has been embraced. And there are so many times where I have felt like, give me the name of that constituent and we'll take care of it in our constituent service office to try and make it, make it work. I think we need to be serious about working together, stop these frivolous lawsuits, and get down to making this law the great law that it could be. Thank you. I yield back. Hmm. Gentlemen, yields back. Now, Mr. Collins is recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm hearing a lot of passion uh, by the Democrats on the other side about why we are holding what they call a partisan hearing. I guess I, I have uh, three children. I have three grandchildren with a fourth on the way. That's why I'm here. That's why I think this hearing and others like it are important. It's about our children. It's about our grandchildren and the fact that every dollar of deficit that we, we spend today are dollars that my children, the other children in America, and the grandchildren are going to have to repay. We're not living within our means. I go back to that every single time I cast a vote. It seems as though Democrats, whether it's Zika funding or anything else, or, their solution is always the same. Borrow more money that my children and grandchildren have to pay back. You talk about disrespectful, now that is disrespectful. If we can't pay our way now, what are we doing in, in borrowing on the backs of our children and grandchildren? It's just fundamentally immoral. So here we are, Affordable Care Act. Talk about bait and switch. Talk about false advertising. America, here's this great plan, and here's what it's going to cost. Well, it's costing billions, if not trillions, more than it was supposed to cost. And so when we get into a hearing like this, where the administration has inappropriately put $7 billion, and I'd like to remind the Democrats on the other side where that would go. That would fully fund Zika and rebuild 5,000 bridges in America that have fallen apart at a million dollar a bridge. $7 billion would fully fund Zika. $7 billion on top of that would rebuild 5,000 bridges in America. That's why this hearing matters, to remind the Americans that dollars matter. So, Mr. Miller, here's kind of a rhetorical question for you. If the $7 billion hadn't flowed into the insurance companies and what we would say was, was beyond the constitutional authority of the administration, uh, what would have happened to premiums across the ACA? There are a lot of moving parts on that front. If you uh, follow one line of argument that the insurers would still be required uh, to provide these subsidies, uh, those premiums would be higher. But you've got a lot of moving parts well, going on at just, the same time. Well, but if we, if we stop there, because the, the, the uh, uh, CSR is part of the ACA, so they would have to continue to provide right. them. And if there's not funding, you could argue one way or the other, premiums go up and maybe the federal government no. then would have to... to uh, uh, the broader answer is by making Congress responsible, as it should be, for deciding how to sort that out. There'd be a lot of cross pressures. And we don't sure. know how Congress might decide to subsidize right. and, and, and low those, income individuals sure. differently. And in those cost pressures, we may decide to change some things. We may decide to prioritize our children's future. We may decide to prioritize our grandchildren's future. We may decide to prioritize Zika funding. We may decide to prioritize infrastructure repairs. But this administration, in what we would say is an unconstitutional overreach, decided they would set the priorities. 
and the president said he had the phone in a pen. I don't know that he ever calls anybody, but he sure uses the pen all the time. And so I think that's where this oversight hearing is, is absolutely proper. And I'll just bring up another point that, that uh, and maybe this is a nuance, but we should do it anyway. There's something called the Anti-Deficiency Act. And under the Anti-Deficiency Act, Congress can sue an individual, an individual who misappropriates government funding without an appropriation request. It's got to be an individual. And this administration has continued to refuse to put anyone's name on the line that was involved in what we would say was an illegal decision making. And, and would just ask you, sir, if, if that's a proper interpretation. If we don't have a name, we can't sue someone under the Anti-Deficiency Act that misappropriated money. That's correct, because the way it applies, you have to have an accountable official, and that is a little bit of a mysterious uh, effort right now. And we have been attempting to get some names. We can't get names. So I guess we'll hold hearings. We'll invite the secretary in. She refuses to come in. I guess, I guess that's her right. I don't know. Maybe we can get her in here another way. But those are those little nuances that do matter. I believe they matter quite a lot. But I'll go back and just say, it, this is about my children and grandchildren. It's about respecting the taxpayers. That's why this hearing's occurring. We respect the taxpayers, the United States of America, and future generations who will be robbed of the opportunity to live the American dream that we grew up in, because they're going to be so saddled with debt. The debate will become the debate we're seeing today in Venezuela, in Greece, and Puerto Rico. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Mr. Flores for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panel for joining us today. I want to uh, uh, to tell the truth uh, to offset some of the the claims we've heard from the other side about how how great the Affordable Care Act has been. Uh, the architect of the plan has said publicly that. Uh, if they could fool Americans into this, that uh, they would eventually like it. Well, Americans still don't like it. Uh, Americans were promised they could keep their doctor. That turned out to be a lie. They were promised they could keep their insurance plan. Another lie. They were promised that premiums would go lower. A third lie. And it goes on and on and on. And I want to remind everybody what the Constitution simply says. And it says that, well, let me come back to that in a minute. Uh, also, uh, one of the claims from uh, one of the folks on the other side was that this was a frivolous lawsuit. Mr. Lazarus admitted the validity of the lawsuit. The courts have upheld the validity of the lawsuit. If it was a frivolous lawsuit, they would have thrown it out originally. So just so that we have a clear context for where we're going. Now, Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 7 says, No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Period. It doesn't say if the administration deems it to be that way or if it reads the law. A particular way. Uh, so my, my questions are this. Um, so we've, we've, we've gone, we've had unprecedented levels of obstruction from this administration, uh, and that indicates that they've got something to hide. If they didn't have anything to hide, they'd send us the unredacted documents. They'd send us every document we asked for. They'd send the witnesses. They wouldn't tamper with the witnesses. They would let the witnesses answer the questions. If they didn't have anything to hide, they would do that. And so, we. but nonetheless, even though they've attempted to cover this up and to cover up their illegal actions, we've learned a lot about the administration's decision to unconstitutionally fund this program, and we're gonna to continue to pursue the facts. We have another problem here, though. As Congress continues to carry out its constitutional obligation to, con to conduct congressional oversight of the executive branch, which is a necessary part, a constitutional part of our checks and balances, the administration sinks to new depths to withhold information from Congress, and this is unacceptable. So, Mr. Rosenberg, I have a couple of questions. Um, there have been executive claims of confidential, uh, or, uh, the, the administration has sort of tried to claim privileges. One is called confidentiality claims, and the other one is called heightened sensitivities. Are you aware of any such privilege that the executive branch has no. to withhold information? Okay. Not with regard to that. No. Um, the administration has clearly obstructed Congress, congressional investigation here. Do you agree with that, Mr. Rosenberg? I'm sorry. The, that Congress has clearly, excuse me, the administration has clearly obstructed uh, Congress trying to, to pursue this matter. Do you agree with that? Yes. From okay. From what I've been reading and what I know, yes. One of the things, um, the direction of Mr. Mullen was headed is that he was asking what could Congress be doing to ensure that it has uh, the access it needs to conduct oversight um, to uh, to help pa uh, Congress pass legislation, um, 
I mean, what, what additional steps do we need to take? You need to shore up your ability to enforce your subpoenas. Okay. And there are two ways to do it. Uh, traditionally, you've had a criminal contempt process. But the administration has come out with a dicta that says uh, we can block that, that we don't have to, uh, you know, go, go, to, uh, go to court to do it, and you can't because it's unconstitutional. Uh, it interferes with presidential prerogatives. Uh, you used to have and still have uh, another course. It's called inherent contempt, where uh, uh, you can bring a recalcitrant officer before the bar of the, <laughs> of the House, uh, question him and hold him in contempt, uh, and even jail him at that particular point. That's been deemed unseemly and also unconstitutional by the Justice Department. What you need to do is to make, do two things. One, you have to make the inherent contempt process seemly. That is, uh, don't make it appear draconian, that you go out, you arrest, detain, try, and then can put them in, you know, put them in jail for it. What you want is to get information, and you need leverage to do it. If you bring someone in, uh, have an adjudicatory proceeding in which uh, the facts about the obstruction are uh, looked at and determined by a committee with a recommendation that there be a, uh, a trial before the, before the House, have the person brought, you know, brought in, uh, testify, and as a result, there would be a fine, not imprisonment, but a fine uh, that uh, what, you know the, that went against the salary of of the particular person. That would have an effect after it was upheld. It will be challenged, of course. Uh, after it's upheld, uh, uh, a finding of inherent contempt uh, w would trigger you know a point of order with regard to salaries, and uh, that will get out, and that will. Uh, Bring it attention. Thank Second you. thing you can do. Well, sir, uh, so, yeah. we are way out of time, okay. and we have votes coming up in a couple minutes. If you would be so kind as to submit other recommendations for the record. In fact, I'd like to thank all the witnesses that participated in today's hearing and remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record and ask the witnesses all Schirmer, the questions properly. I, but okay. you would like to make a I just want to say one thing briefly, which is um, I, I really don't question the motives of the majority here. I think it's in the congressional prerogative to file a lawsuit um, if, if Congress believes that the administration has overstepped its constitutional bounds. But, but um, you know, I, I do think based on what Mr. Lazarus has said today and what the administration filed in their, in their brief, there, there, there may be an honest disagreement here. We believe that the administration had the constitutional ability to um, establish well, the general idea. No, I won't. To establish the CSR, and also to and also to um, to to implement it. But be that as it may, I feel at what what the Democrats are trying to say here today it, it, it is that we're, we're trying to say that um, e even if there's a general disagreement on the constitutional authority. This problem could be easily resolved by Congress by passing legislation to clarify it. And the thing we're concerned about is Mr. if this Chairman, C can I get a parliamentary if this CSR here? if this CSR fund is this out of order if if this C if this CSR fund is struck down by the court, then 6.4 million people will lose their subsidies. That's and so true. not true. It, That's not true. And so, Mr. Chairman. And so, so the result is we really hope that what we're trying to say is there's been no effort to fix this, and irrespective of what happens in the court, in the court, in the in the court case, we need to work together to try to make sure these people can get affordable insurance. That's all I'm trying to say, and I yield back. It, it, it's been uh, just to the other members. It, it's been our tradition, the subcommittee. That I, I give the ranking member and myself and just I'm a just wrap up moment, and I would say, I disagree. Uh, I would ask members to read the Joint Congressional Investigative Report and the sources of funding of the ACA's cost-sharing program where we outline a lot of these things. Um, this 
committee uh, is dedicated to try to find some solutions for health care. We are not abandoning those who are in need. Um, there is a constitutional question here. Uh, I fundamentally disagree with a lot of what Mr. Lazarus says, that good intentions don't automatically mean good results. Uh, and we need to pull together on this. I do agree we need to find some solutions here. None of us want to leave people who are of low income out on the lurch with regard to health care. But uh, simply declaring that because I intended it, we can make it so is not a constitutional answer, and we will continue to uphold that. I thank all the members for this. Uh, and I would suggest if other members have other questions to submit to this panel, please uh, get them to us. Mr. Chairman, I we would appreciate submit that if the administration provide the documents, it might make this a little easier. Yes, we, they, uh, they've covered up. Thank you. I, I want to say that we have asked for a lot of those documents. We're going to continue to do that. But with all this, I now adjourn this subcommittee. You did. You took all the flack very well. <laughs>